I'm sure you've heard of the French novelist Alexander Dumas. He's the author of The Count of Monte Cristo and The Three Musketeers. Well, Dumas' father, also named Alexander Dumas, was actually the inspiration for those stories. He was a soldier during the French Revolutionary Wars and quickly rose through the ranks by his feats of strength and bravery. As a general, he led 50,000 men in battle. And he was black. Born in present-day Haiti, Dumas was the son of a French nobleman and a black slave. As a general, he was a celebrated war hero, but then he got on the wrong side of that other French general, Napoleon. Alexander Dumas, the father, was pretty much forgotten to history until now. Best-selling author Tom Reese has written a biography of General Dumas. It's called The Black Count, and he joins me in the studio. Tom, welcome to the program. Thanks, Mimi. Hi. This is quite a story. How did you find out about this? Ah, well, yes, it's a, it's an exciting story. And I found out about it actually as a kid. I was a big fan of the writer Alexander Dumas and The Three Musketeers and The Count of Monte Cristo was my favorite book. And I liked these stories so much that I actually hunted down the memoirs of the author. And he wrote them when he was 45 uh, at the height of his fame after he published those novels, and he was really the most popular writer in the world at the time. And the remarkable thing about the memoirs is that he doesn't talk about himself for the first 200 pages. He only talks about this man, this incredible man, who was his father. And to read the life story of his father told by the son is like reading The Count of Monte Cristo and The Three Musketeers and The Man in the Iron Mask, all in (laughs) one, only more outlandish and more exciting because the main character is a black man living in a white world and well, rising well, to the sort of top before falling to the absolute depths. It's sort of a, a, a triumph and tragedy story. Well, describe Alex Dumas physically. What did he look like? Oh, well, Alex Dumas physically looked kind of like a movie star. I mean, he was incredibly imposing, handsome. He was very tall for this time. He was over six feet tall. And I mean, just all the descriptions of him are of someone who is almost like a, they like to compare him to a Greek hero, to sort of the people that were in statues. And he Um, definitely looked black though. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. I mean, skin color wise, he was unmistakably black. There was no way that this man could have passed. I mean, he was he was half black. His father was white, but um, he There's happened a, to have dark skin, and he just was physically really stood out. Imposing. Everybody. Very imposing, and as all the descriptions of the time say, incredibly handsome. And what's interesting is that these are descriptions written all by white people you know, in a slave society, yet they don't find his skin color or the fact that he's obviously of African descent to be at all a drawback. They, in fact, write about... Tom, let's talk about your sources, because there's a little museum in a village in France, yeah. and you go there, and there's a safe locked up with all these great letters inside, and nobody's got the combination. Yeah, it's a kind of kind of research story that could only come in an Alexander Dumas novel, but appropriately enough, it happened to me when I went looking for this story in rural France. I, you know, I, It's sort of a strange story for me I've, I've usually done more modern um, kinds of investigations, modern for me, meaning sometime in the 20th century where I could find at least some living witnesses, uh, even if they were nine, 90 or 95 years old. In this case, the story took place 200 years ago, and it was effectively buried. and um, Intentionally buried. Intentionally buried. And so the records hadn't been destroyed, but most records, the best records, had not been looked at in almost 150 years. And in fact, um, I did what seemed obvious. I went to the town where Alex Dumas died in 1806. And the woman that I went there to meet, who had been sitting, who was sitting on this interesting collection of documents that she had been gathering, died two weeks before I arrived. And so, oh, and as you mentioned, she was a bit paranoid and she put everything of value into this big, uh, huge, tall safe that she had in this government office that she worked in, in the back of this little municipal museum. And when she died, she didn't tell anybody the combination and she wasn't 
you know, she, they, they actually searched the office and everywhere. No one could figure out how to get in the safe. So I talked to all the people in the town, in the mayor's office, in the bureaucracy, and they said, well, there's really nothing. We can't blow up the safe. So what are we going to do? And the woman who, the only person who had the combination is dead. So I had so to. So you went out drinking with the deputy mayor, got him drunk. Well, and don't, then, don't give away everything that happens. <laughs> and then the, blew the open story. the safe. <laughs> well, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise we couldn't have the book. So, uh, yeah. Actually, not blew blew it open. I, I we we used a you stethos- cracked it. a stethoscope and some drills. Yeah, yeah, it was very good. The book we're discussing is called "The Black Count: Glory, Revolution, Betrayal, and the Real Count of Monte Cristo." Tom Reese is a best-selling author. He's in the studio with me. Going back to Alex Dumas' origins, his father was essentially a loser from France. He was a nobleman. <laughs> a, I, first time I've heard anybody describe him so candidly and correctly. Yeah. And he went to the French colony, which is now Haiti. What yes. happened there? Yeah, he was the um, Alex's father, Antoine, was really a renegade nobleman, kind of a ne'er do well, who had gone to this colony that later is called Haiti. At the time, it was called Saint Domingue. And this was at the time when this was the most valuable piece of real estate in the world. It was the center of the French colonial empire. It was really where all of the money that built royal France came from. Versailles. Because of the sugar. Because of the sugar. It was the center of the world's sugar trade. It had the most and the best sugar in the world at a time when sugar was both a medicine as well as just this incredibly sought out commodity. So sugar was sort of the oil of the 18th century and this colony was the Saudi Arabia of the 18th century. And so all of these... Um, Basically, young men of fortune, young nobles who didn't know what else to do with themselves would go. It was like the Wild West, the gold rush. They would all go there to try to make their fortune. But this guy, Antoine, he was really going there to sponge off of his younger brother, who was- Who was really working. Who was really working and who was also, among other things, a big slave trader then and traded slaves and sugar out of a little piece of land in the north of Haiti called Monte Cristo. And so that is, uh, as you might imagine, related to what later happens. So then Antoine has a relationship with his slave. He has several children, and the youngest is Alex. Exactly. The the youngest and the boy that he is most attached to is his son, Alex. And But as you say, Antoine is really not a very good guy, and he essentially, well, among other things, he has, I mean, it's, there are amazing stories family stories I discovered in all of these documents, but one of them is that he has a fight with his younger brother, and the younger brother almost kills him, and Antoine takes three of his brother's slaves, including one that after 30 years, he He gets wind. He decides it's time to go back to France. Well, he gets wind of an inheritance, a massive inheritance for himself, plus a title that he could get, but he's going to have to come out of hiding. He decides to risk it, he goes down to Port-au-Prince, but oh. he can't afford a ship ticket back to France. So and he sells his own children. Absolutely. He sells his own children, and he is such a bastard, but he has this relationship with his son, Alex. So I found, actually, the piece of paper he wrote selling his son, and he didn't sell Alex. He pawned him. What it, what it was was a pawn ticket that said he had a right to buy him back. And he, the, the father goes to France, inherits the fortune, and sure enough, within a year, he buys Alex out and brings him and... Um, and spends our, lavishly on him. Well, first, I should say, our the first record I have of our hero in really in arriving in history is in the year 1776. It's very important because it's this revolutionary period. He arrives at the moment of our revolution in France, listed in the ship's manifest as the slave Alexander, the slave of this other guy on the ship but shortly afterwards he gets off the ship and as you say his father brings him suddenly into this life of luxury in the shadow of the court of Versailles. So what would you say is the relationship between father and son? Tense. (laughs) Um, I mean the father was a very weird and capricious man. I mean selfish. So incredibly selfish. He shortly after coming back and you know he's when he was in hiding for 30 years and during Alex's first 15 years, his father is just known as Antoine of the Islands, Antoine de Lille, because he's going under the pseudonym. And then as soon as he gets back to France, he suddenly inherited the title and he's now the Marquis Antoine um, Alexandre David de la Paetrie. And his love son. Love long French Yeah, days. yeah, it's beautiful. <laughs> well, uh, suddenly uh, Alex, who's listed in the, as the slave Alexander, a year later, his name is 
Count Thomas Alexander David de la Paetrie. The relationship between Alex and his father is tense, and his father decides to marry their servant, who's 50 years younger than he is, or about give or take a few. And um, Alex has seen his own mother being sold, and this is sort of probably his father's fourth mistress that he's taking on. And uh, Alex is only able to take it for a few years, and then he has a huge break with his father. And that break really is him joining the army as a private. It's him joining the army at the lowest rank, and it is also for history and for our story an amazing moment because it is when he decides to throw off his noble name and throw off all connection to this noble family, and he invents, when he signs up for the enlistment, he invents a new name. He takes his real name, his first name, Alexander, but for his second name, he writes down his what we believe is his mother's name, Dumas meaning of the plantation, and he writes Alexandre Dumas, and that's the first record record we have of that name, and that's the name he goes by for the rest of his life, although he prefers to be called Alex. The book we're discussing is called The Black Count. It's about the father of the novelist Alexandre Dumas. Tom Reese is a best-selling author. He's in the studio with me. So why did he join as a private, not as an officer? Because he had the right to join as an officer. Yes, indeed, this was a strange thing, and this is part of his break with his father. He's deliberately throwing off all of his noble right. At the time, even a tw- at the time, the French army was very corrupt, and even a twelve or a fourteen-year-old boy, if they were the son of a noble, as I found out, they could get an officer's commission in the army. They could. There even there were thirteen-year-old colonels, and Alex joins at the lowest rank, and he just joins this very rough and tumble kind of group of Queen's Dragoons. It's still the last couple of years of Royal France before the revolution. And these guys are stationed on France's borders, both to protect the borders, but also to kind of chase down highwaymen and um, essentially combat robbery in the countryside. And it's, Did he face racism, though, in France during that time? This is the remarkable thing I found out. Even before the revolution, there is this incredible space that has opened up in the... 1770s, even a little bef- even before that in France, as a result of what is, I would say, the world's first civil rights movement. And this is an incredible, there's so many incredible forgotten things in this story. And aside from the life of Alex Dumas, which has been suppressed, I would say that this civil rights movement has in a way been deliberately suppressed by by the French, uh, by the powers that be in France for various reasons we could get into, but it's a bizarre thing that they suppress it because they had the world's first civil rights movement, and even though they were paradoxically the empire and the country that benefited the most from slavery and they had the cruelest conditions for slaves, at the same time, there were these crusading lawyers and um, people in Paris who won incredible rights for black people decades before these rights were won in any other country. So within a year, Dumas goes from being a corporal to a brigadier general. And he's <laughs> yeah. leading, you know, 10,000 men. And this is just the beginning, yeah. 